It's okay not to be okay, but I promise I'm trying. By Ray Ray, 118. Chapter 7, Redo. Waking up the next morning, Harry once more experienced the unpleasant sensation of not remembering where he was. It only took a moment before he recalled the events of the previous evening. He took a deep breath before sitting up, pleased to note the absence of pain. Madame Pomfrey really was a godsend. Looking around at the rather bare room, Harry bit his lip in thought. Living with a professor would be a bit of an adjustment, but he was happy to be able to see his godfather as well. He didn't know what to expect for the rest of the summer, but it had to be better than the start. He looked over to where he saw his trunk sitting next to the dresser, waiting to be unpacked. He stood up and moved over to search for some clean clothes. Everything he had was at least four sizes too large, and most had holes in them as well. He grimaced, trying to find the least ratty t-shirt, slipping it over his head with a sigh. Next, he decided to pull out his ancient runes textbook, thinking he'd be able to read a chapter or two before breakfast. His somewhat battered watch showed the time to be quite early. It was nearly an hour later when a house elf popped into Harry's room, startling him out of his runes reading. Hello, he said, surprised, setting down the book and swinging his legs over the side of the bed. The elf looked slightly startled, but bobbed up and down eagerly. Mistress sent Tippy to tell Mr. Harry that breakfast is ready, it squeaked. Harry nodded. Thank you, Tippy, he replied, smiling kindly. The elf reminded him a little bit of Dobby though perhaps a bit more toned-down version. I'll be down shortly, the elf nodded, looking awed at his kindness, and disappeared, and Harry put on his shoes, running a hand through his hair as he left his room, trying to remember the route to the dining room. He only got lost once, and was quite hungry by the time he found his way to the impressive room. The table could easily sit thirty people, with room to spare. There was gilding along the walls, and a remarkable chandelier was hanging from the ceiling. Minerva and Sirius were seated at one end, with what looked like breakfast for ten surrounding them. As soon as Harry sat down, he was accosted by his godfather, who wasted no time in piling his plate with a traditional English breakfast. Harry looked down at the fried eggs, bacon, fried tomatoes, mushrooms, toast, sausages and baked beans, and winced. He was hungry, but he wasn't sure he was that hungry. He turned pleading eyes on his godfather, who just smiled. You need to eat more, he told his godson. He held out a vial to the young wizard. Madame Pomfrey is setting up a plan for you, but it involves taking these nutrient potions for the next month. It should help with your appetite, and it needs to be taken with a meal. Harry grimaced but dutifully took the offered potion, downing it in one gulp and turning to the loaded plate in front of him. Surprisingly, the more he ate, the hungrier he became. He figured that was the potion at work, and he had cleared his plate within five minutes. Both adults watched with varying degrees of relief, pleased to see him with a healthy appetite. Sirius passed him more toast and bacon, which he took with a ruthful grin. Sirius returned the smile, before setting the plate of food down and turning to Minerva, indicating that she tell their young charge the plan for the day. Minerva gave him a soft glare, knowing that he just didn't want to have to be the one to break the news to Harry. She sighed at his nonchalant attitude, and turned back to the soon-to-be fourth year. I've set up a meeting with Amelia Bones and the head of the Department of Child Welfare, Patricia Welding. They should both be here at eleven. Poppy will be present as well, and will give them evidence of your mistreatment. Harry nodded, uncomfortable, staring at his plate. Minerva reached out with one hand, resting it on his shoulder reassuringly. We're all on your side, Harry. I don't foresee any complications, so... Don't worry. Harry nodded again, 
before quietly asking to be excused. On Minerva's approval, he disappeared back to his bedroom. He had a couple of hours. With any luck, he might be able to finish the third year Ancient Runes textbook before the meeting he was beginning to dread. Not that he didn't believe McGonagall, but he didn't relish the idea of having to tell someone else about his humiliation at the hands of his relatives. Minerva was the one to tell Harry that their guests had arrived. Serious, they had decided, it would be best to stay out of the way for the time being. They would meet with Amelia later, but while Miss Wilding was here, it would be best not to inform her of the situation. Hurry? Minerva queried, knocking and opening the door hesitantly. Harry looked up from his book, and Minerva smiled, seeing at how studious he was being. It looked like he had blown right through the runes textbook. She would have to test him later to see how much he understood. Poppy, Madame Bones and Ms. Wilding are here. Would you come and join us, please? Harry nodded, marking his page and setting down the book, before joining Minerva for the walk down to the sitting room. He once more wished he had clothes that fit him. It would be bad enough having to tell complete strangers about his childhood, but it would have been better if he at least had been somewhat presentable. Unfortunately, that wasn't something he could remedy at the moment, so Harry just followed his possible future guardian. Once inside the sitting room, Minerva set up several privacy wards and blocked off the flu, on the unlikely but possible chance that someone were to try to call on her while they were busy. That act done, she turned back to the room. Harry was looking increasingly nervous, and both Amelia and Patricia looked characteristically serious. Poppy looked grim. Harry, this is Amelia Bones from the Department of Magical Law Enforcement, and Patricia Welding, from the Department of Child Welfare. Both women stepped forward to shake the boy's hand, running a critical eye over everything from the baggy clothes to the rather remarkable black eye. At the questioning glance towards Poppy revealed why the bruise was still so prominent. I thought it would be best for any investigation if you were to allow to take photos before I did any more. I have a list of physical maladies over the years, and have begun to work on correcting them. She handed over a piece of parchment several feet long, causing Amelia's eyes to narrow, while Harry just looked like he wished the floor would swallow him whole. The nervous suggestion to sit down was welcomed by them all, and she guided Harry over to the sofa, while Amelia and Patricia took the love seat, still reading over the rather impressive list of injuries and Poppy claimed an armchair. The detailed sheet of parchment began with a broken arm 11 years previously, and continued on, listing several broken ribs, a broken leg, six separate concussions, a dislocated shoulder and a broken wrist, just to name a few. When they were done reading, Amelia conferred with Patricia for a moment, before deciding to get the pictures out of the way first. Harry was oddly detached throughout the process, following the gentle instructions mechanically, as he removed his shirt and stood up, allowing them to take photos of the bruises on his chest and the scars on his back. All four women were hard pressed to keep themselves calm as the current and previous injuries were exposed. Minerva wanted to go to Privet Drive and give those horrible excuses for human beings a piece of her mind. But one look at the young man in front of her, and she knew he needed her more. As soon as Harry was told he could put his shirt back on, he complied, his face growing warm as no one spoke. He was surprised out of his humiliation when he felt a pair of arms around him, hugging him gently. He closed his eyes tightly, trying to stop the tears as he leaned into his professor's steady embrace. This hug was nothing like the ones he had received on occasion from Hermione or Mrs Weasley. It wasn't even similar to the ones he had received from Ginny, though it felt more akin to that one rather than the other two. He didn't feel in danger of breaking in half, 
nor did he feel like she was deliberately being gentle out of a fear of injuring him. Instead, he just felt wanted. He could feel her caring, her worry, and he knew that it was because of him. It was a strange feeling, but it was one he knew he would always cherish. Minerva guided him back to the couch, and everyone took a moment to regain their composure. When she felt he was ready, Amelia leaned forward, taking out a piece of parchment and a quill to take notes, and asked Harry to tell them a little about his childhood. You don't have to speak about anything you're not comfortable with, Mr. Potter, she assured him. I just want to know about your relatives. Harry nodded, looking at his lap, and began to speak. His voice was quiet and hesitant at first, until Minerva took one of his hands in hers and lent him whatever comfort she could. He gained confidence from that, knowing with that one small gesture that she didn't think it was his fault, whatever his relatives may have told him. And with the comforting present of his new Aunt Minerva and his godfather, he knew that, eventually, their hold on him would diminish. It would take time, but he could begin to understand, now, that everything his uncle had done was wrong. It wasn't his fault. It was a liberating experience, and a new outlook that Harry knew would take getting used to. For over half an hour, Harry spoke about his childhood. He relayed the first memory he had of his uncle knocking him around. When he was two years old, he had received a broken arm because he had dared to play with one of Dudley's toys. He told them of the days and weeks he had spent locked up in his bedroom of the cupboard under the stairs, with little to no food, and the periodic beatings he had received when he had performed some feat of accidental magic. He told them of the bad days Vernon would take out on him, and of Dudley's 11th birthday trip to the zoo, and the consequences of setting that snake free. He spoke of the summer after his first year, and the bars on his window that the youngest Weasley males had to break off in order to rescue him. He once more talked about what had happened with Marge the previous summer, and why he had felt like running away had been his only option. Finally, Harry told them what had happened this summer, how he had been immediately locked up in his room, only to be let out the next morning and forced into servitude for the entire day. He told them about the week he had spent in Privet Drive, with one very meagre meal a day and the physical punishments. He explained how Vernon had come home one night, furious at having lost an important client, and how he had somehow decided that it was all Harry's fault. Him and his freakishness. When he was finished, Harry closed his eyes, afraid of the reaction of the adults around him. He was relieved when Minerva's only response was to pull Harry closer to her, hugging him gently and trying to pass on her support and pride in him. Minerva waited for an extra minute until Harry seemed to regain some composure before she pulled out a form she had brought with her in preparation. Thank you for telling us, Harry, she said gently. Harry nodded, still not looking up. I will waste no time in filing this change of guardianship form. Minerva has stated her desire to become your legal guardian. Is that acceptable to you? Harry nodded again, glancing over at his professor. And now, guardian. A ghost of a smile made its way across his face, indicating his consent. Patricia nodded decisively, filling out new lines before looking back up and holding out of the form. I just need you to sign this, Minerva. The Transfiguration Professor immediately did so with no hesitation, handing the form back once she had signed her consent to become Harry's legal guardian. Patricia put it in her bag and smiled. This is where my involvement ends, Mr. Potter. 
Professor McGonagall. I will file this immediately, and, as you asked, it will be done so quietly. No one should know until and unless you tell them. She let out a smirk. Being the head of department has some perks. She turned to Amelia. Madam Bones, the rest is up to you. Amelia nodded her thanks towards her colleague as Minerva stood up to unblock the flue so that Patricia could leave, which she did so with a little delay after saying her farewells. Poppy asked if she was still needed, to which she was given a negative answer. She nodded and stood up, setting the bag she had brought with her on the coffee table. This is a supply of potions and a bruise balm for you, Mr Potter. There are instructions inside, and these should last you for a month, at least. I shall return next week to check on your progress. Harry nodded, and Minerva thanked her co-worker before Poppy left too. The professor then blocked off the flu once more, before sitting back down next to Harry. When it was just the three of them, Amelia focused on Harry. I think the next thing we need to do is decide what action to take against the Dursleys. Harry, do you want to press charges? Harry considered his options. Did he want to take this further? After all, he was away from them, and he would never have to see them again. Did he really want to drag it out? And because of his stupid fame, pressing charges would undoubtedly mean press involvement. And he really wasn't keen on the entire wizarding world finding out that he, the boy who lived, saviour of the wizarding world, hadn't even been able to defend himself from an overweight muggle. Harry couldn't make this decision on his own, so he turned to his new guardian. What do you think? he asked hesitantly, still a little uncertain as to how to treat the formidable woman who had, until recently, been just another professor. Minerva was overjoyed that Harry was seeking her advice and she was not shy in giving it. This needs to be your decision, Harry. However, I don't think Vernon or Petunia should get away with their actions. What they did to you was wrong, and they should be held culpable. That being said, I do understand that you may not want to draw this out, and I will stand behind you, whatever you choose. Harry nodded, still thinking. It was nice to know that she would support him, no matter what. His eyes grew more thoughtful as a new course of action occurred to him, one that might give him what he wanted, and still see Vernon punished for his crimes. He turned back to the head of the DMLE. Do you have investigators? he asked curiously. Amelia nodded, confused, and Harry continued. Would it be possible to investigate Uncle Vernon? before you take any action. I'd really prefer to keep this out of the papers, but from what I've overheard from Uncle Vernon over the years, I think an investigation might uncover other crimes that are prosecutable. If that information were to find its way into the hands of Muggle authorities... Harry trailed off, and Amelia understood the implications. It truly was a masterstroke. She admired. Minerva also looked pleased and proud. That is an almost Slytherin idea, she commented, her tone neutral, though her gaze was approving. Harry looked down, embarrassed. Well, the sorting hat did want to put me in Slytherin, he admitted, almost afraid of how she might take it. Minerva's only response was a quirked eyebrow. What made it change its mind? she asked curiously. Harry looked up when he didn't hear any disgust in her tone. He shrugged. I heard Matt Malfoy first. I didn't ask for Gryffindor. I just didn't want to be in the same house as that racist prick. Minerva's eyes danced as she commented. I should reprimand you for your language, but I've spent enough time teaching that boy to know that your description is more than accurate. Harry grinned, and Minerva was quick to add. But if you repeat that for anyone, you will be grounded until you are 30. That caused Amelia to laugh, 
bringing their attention back to their visitor. Emilia shuffled through her notes on her lap, and brought the meeting back to the business they had yet to attend to. Now that it is just the three of us, I was hoping to talk about Sirius Black. Mr. Potter, I have been informed that you have a way of getting in touch with him. Minerva and Harry shared a knowing look, before Minerva excused herself for a moment. Harry and Amelia sat in awkward silence for a few minutes, before Harry asked, You're related to Susan Bones, right? Amelia nodded, perplexed. She is my niece. I am also her guardian, as her parents, my brother and sister-in-law, were killed in the war. Harry nodded. I'm sorry for your loss, he said compassionately, and Amelia knew he really understood. He had lost his parents as well. If anyone understood the crushing weight of grief, it would be Harry Potter. Harry shifted in his seat. Would you tell her I said hello? He asked, somewhat hesitantly. That surprised Amelia. Of course, she agreed. Though I wasn't aware the two of you were such good friends. Harry looked a little embarrassed. We're not, really, he admitted. But even though we're in different houses, we're still in the same year, and Susan's always been nice to me. I'd like to try and cultivate better relationships with my classmates from now on. I've come to realise that I've sort of isolated myself the past few years. Ron and Hermione are my best of friends, but there are a lot of other great people attending Hogwarts that I would probably want to get to know. Amelia was impressed. And she said so. Harry's face turned a light pink colour, though he also seemed pleased with the praise. The moment was interrupted by Minerva returning to the room looking uncharacteristically nervous. Trailing in behind her, looking grim, was wanted fugitive Sirius Black. End of chapter. Hi guys, hope you enjoyed that one. Oh, thank goodness they're doing this, and they're doing it so quickly. Harry needs this. He needs it so badly. And I love that bit at the end with him reaching out and being so compassionate and knowing there are better people. Harry is so unbelievably emotionally mature for his age. It's insane. And that bit with Minerva hugging him and him just feeling wanted. God, I wanted to leap through my screen and give him a hug too. No one deserves to feel unwanted like that. Anyway, you guys know the drill. Like, comment and subscribe and hit that bell to get notified for whenever I upload a new video. Have a good day night or whatever time zone you're in. Bye my guys, gals and I'll buy my pals. I'll see you in another video. Take care.